Hi, I'm Jeff Clarkson. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at UT Comp. UT Comp is the company that has developed and deploys Ultra Analytics, which is a non-destructive, non-intrusive system for evaluating and determining the condition of fiber reinforced polymer or FRP and dual laminates. Today, I'm going to talk about how ultra analytics analysis of corrosion barrier damage in FRP and dual laminates is done. The purpose of doing this analysis is to provide a safe, valid, and reliable approach for determining corrosion barrier condition. I'll talk about background and definitions, a brief description of ultra analytics, we'll give some corrosion barrier examples, and then I'll talk about application. Typically, FRP is used in a lot of different configurations and, and innumerable applications in the world. Uh, the, uh, the pictures on the left here are from a water treatment facility. In the center, we're at a facility that handles a lot of hydrochloric acid and hydrochloric acid vapor. And from here, we're showing a pulp mill. There are a number of other applications that can be used from, uh, from your municipal wastewater facilities all the way up to uh, hand, handling extremely hazardous chemicals. Back when we started developing FRP, we found that the smart way to, to build it for corrosion applications was to place a corrosion barrier here on the inner surface of the FRP. And the, the purpose of this is to provide a resin rich environment or a resin rich barrier that gets in the way of the, of the corrosive materials inside the equipment and penetrating and causing damage to, or potentially causing damage to the structural layers, which are also made out of glass and, re and resin but they're, uh, they're meant to be protected by this corrosion barrier. We've also found that we can use thermoplastics and these thermoplastics are things like polyvinyl chloride or, uh, or you could use a Teflon material or polyethylene and so on. The whole idea is again, to use this material to protect, be a barrier to damage of the structural layers from the chemicals inside being contained. Over 70 years or so of FRP experience, we've developed lots of standards and codes. And in fact, the recent search showed me that there were 211 or so that were all based on design, manufacture, and construction. And there were zero for inspection or what I call fitness for service, FFS. In fact, uh, this is looking at organizations like the American Society for Testing and Materials, American Society for Mechanical Engineers, the American Petroleum Institute, DIN, ISO, and, uh, and so on. When we build FRP, and again, this goes back, much of this does go back to the earlier standards for design, we select materials for it. For FRP resin, we actually use a standard that's been put together by ASTM. Its designation is C581. Often we will use some supplier literature as well. And the results for C581 are pretty good. They're actually based on data. You, we measure changes in resin when they're placed into test environments or, or when coupons are placed into test environments. So we can actually have a, an objective way to determine whether a resin will work. For thermoplastics, we have some of that capability with coupon testing. Uh, the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, or NACE, has a test method. There's also a lot of reliance on published literature and supplier literature. Reinforcement is, is often considered a commodity. Uh, it makes up about 13% of the volume, a higher fraction of the weight because it's denser. But mostly supplier literature is used. Uh, there are some published reviews. And, uh, and however, we can actually use reinforcement in C581 results if we, if we control the, material, the reinforcement as well as the resin for those coupons. 
Originally, corrosion barrier inspection was intrusive. It still is for the most part. Uh, what we do is we go inside to, let's say we go inside a storage tank and say, have we, do we see any damage to the corrosion barrier? And in fact, I'm showing a picture of a corrosion barrier here. And what we do is we take a look at the color and say, does it, does it seem to fit with, with uh, an undamaged state of the resin? Um, how hard is the surface? We will measure that with something called a Barcol hardness tester. Uh, this always requires a confined space entry. We might take a cutout. We might say, hi, oh, you know, we want to take a look through the cross section a little bit more. We want to do some other testing. So we maybe take a cut out. We cut a hole in here and we place a nozzle in or something in order to repair it, which of course requires repair. There's almost no relationship of the results of this inspection to the ASTM C581 results. We've progressed along that. So now I, let's say I took that cutout and in fact, what I've got here is I'm showing the cross section through exactly the same piece that I showed in the previous photograph. And so from that cutout, I could do a couple of things. I can look at the edge and I can measure how deep I can see staining from the internal conditions. I can't see this on the surface. And in fact, you can see I've got a ruler measuring it and it, it works out to be pretty close to about four millimeters or so. Or I can put this, this same section under an electron microscope, which I've done, which uh, I, we've had done here. And from that, we use what's called energy dispersive X-ray or EDX, and we can measure how much of a particular atom might be found at a certain at certain depths. And here we're looking at chlorine, and so the uh, the chlorine you can see it goes from about three percent here to to five percent, and down to one percent at the uh, at about three millimeters depth. Okay, there are also some other disruptive tests that are possible. Um, there's always repairs required when you do these, when you take a cutout. And there's still no relationship to the, the tests that we used to determine what resin to use in the first place. And that's ASTM C581. So Ultra Analytics performs a little different corrosion barrier inspection. Here we actually see a photo of, uh, of an inspector placing an ultrasonic transducer, and you'll see a picture of this later, using a conventional off-the-shelf ultrasonic flaw detector and saving a reading by following a special procedure. When that reading is saved, then that, that reading that's saved can then be used to evaluate condition at that location, and you can take more readings and determine a better a global overall picture. This is non-destructive. The process can continue to operate. There's no reason to, there's usually no reason to shut down. And it's an established technology. This is a patented system that has had over 10 years of validation. To give an idea of what it is that we see with ultra analytics, well, there's post-processing of the signal. The signal that comes out of the instrument goes through some computer software that cleans up and takes out things that, uh, that don't belong because they're artifacts from other components in the system, like, like transducer issues. So we'll get an image somewhat like this. We know that this red circled area represents the opposite surface. And in fact, at that point, we're able to determine from a function of attenuation and transit time, what the percentage of design stiffness is or PDS. Another way to term the PDS, and this is where you can relate it back to destructive tests, it's what's the current flexural modulus or resistance to bending divided by the theoretical flexural modulus. This test actually aligns very, very nicely with the European standard that uses a 10,000 hour uh, mechanical load test in order to develop the same kinds of results. 
And as well, we end up with, uh, we've got some empirical data that shows that when the PDS is at 40%, we're at the end of life of the resin. Generally speaking, the, the reinforcement is not directly affected as much in these environments, but the resin is very, very important. So ultra analytics actually determines the structural integrity of FRP and has done so for a number of people around the world since 2008. It's valid and reliable. We use off the shelf hardware. There's very unique post-processing software. It's widely evaluated and accepted. And in fact, this chart shows that uh, the relationship of non-destructive PDS to destructive PDS is extremely tight. The R squared value or the correlation is about 93%. That's a, uh, that's a very, very good value. And 95% of the time, we are within 15% of the destructive values. So now I'm going to give an example. We'll start with an FRP corrosion barrier. This is a sample that was removed from a hydrochloric acid storage tank. It was in service for 17 years. The thickness of the shell, total thickness, including the corrosion barrier, was 1.14 inches or 29 millimeters. We had a 0.12 inch corrosion barrier, which, was, which is three millimeters. And the bar call hardness today is greater than 40. Barcoal hardness greater than 40 is almost always very good. So there's no, there's no real observable damage to this resin. It's got, you know, a little bit of staining and so on, but it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't look too bad. It's got good gloss. The veil surface is intact. There's no, there, it's still polished. We can still see mold release. So, we took ultra analytics readings on the outer surface of this sample. And in fact, we follow, well, we followed our regular procedure. We simulated a non-destructive, non-intrusive inspection. And this picture shows the transducer sitting in place and a reading on the flaw detector behind it. We processed that reading. And in fact, uh, what you can see here is the reading after we've run through our processing software. The two readings look a little bit different from each other. And this is the opposite surface. From that, we've actually been able to determine that the full thickness percentage of design stiffness is 89%. That's a pretty good number. With some additional work, we actually, we also know that we identified, in addition to this, we identified this reflection that's a little bit curious. Now, many people would consider this to be a delamination. We actually have determined that it's not a delamination. In fact, um, if you go back to the cross sections that we looked at, uh, we didn't see any evidence that we had a delamination. We just saw a change in color, which is exactly what this is. This is happening at that change in color, or maybe even a little bit before. In fact, it's five millimeters in, and the PDS of this material in this section is 52%, not 89%. So summarizing this thing, we started with what we would look at if we were normally inspecting it, or we could take a cutout, which looks like this, do some energy dispersive x-ray to find out what's in it, or we get the ultrasonic reading where in fact, this green zone in here is represented very closely by that space. And we actually get the destructive results matching up very, very closely with the ultra analytics results. And the destructive, the, the ultra analytics results also relate to the flexural modulus results of ASTM C581. We now have something that relates the performance of this FRP back to the original design conditions. Dual laminates are a little bit different because we have that thermoplastic lining. Here's a picture of one. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a pipe. 
It's got a five millimeter thermoplastic lining. It's actually made out of a material called PVDF. The 32 millimeter thick structural FRP. And what we found is that we've been able to detect from here to here a 5.18 millimeter, so it's five millimeter depth. The PDS in this zone is 44%. And not only that, we actually see that we've got some damage into the FRP of about three millimeters deep, but the FRP PDS is still 95% overall. The best place to actually get readings for uh, thermoplastic linings is at the welds where, you, where two pieces of thermoplastic have been joined. That's because that's where leaks or, or damage often will occur first. But weld locations are not usually provided. In this case, you might get some in this area. And the reason is that uh, there are definitely welds in the miters, but they also have, have overbuilt so much FRP there that it's very difficult to get accurate representative or even good uh, readings over top of the weld because of the way that it's built. Um, so in that case, we just make sure we get enough readings to be able to get a picture of what that looks like. So now what we want to know is, can we do this consistently? Can we actually do it on more than just the examples that we showed you? Well, we got a number of samples that we have in our lab at the office with, that have been exposed to an, quite a wide variety of chemicals for different times. And uh, we've got some visible diffusion and chemical attack in most. You can see, in fact, with some of these photos, we've got something going on here. We've got some significant staining here. There's some really interesting staining. And as well, the corrosion barrier surfaces also present slightly, you know, a variety of conditions. Well, what we did with all of these readings is that when we when we uh, ran the analysis, we said, huh, well, we detected more than the visible depth in most cases, because this line here shows the perfect example of where we would have the same detected depth from ultra analytics as the average visible depth. And you'll notice that we're detecting, for the most part, more depth of damage than the visible than is visible. We're also not detecting um, wide variation at less than visible. That's that's what that area would be here. In fact, there's a 93% probability that ultra analytics will detect equal or greater depth than visible. That makes this a conservative assessment. This is what we solve in order to be able to come up with this. Um, for each reading, we actually solve this, equa this equation. And what we're looking for basically is to get this solution. We're trying to get this value. When we get that value sorted out, we're able to then relate that back to the percentage of design stiffness for a zone. This applies to any corrosion barrier material. It's actually really interesting. It happens, it works for thermoplastics as well as for FRP. And we can also apply it to polymer and elastomer linings. Well, we wanted to know too, does the condition of the lining relate to the depth of diffusion. What we found is it doesn't. <laughs> There's a very poor correlation of depth with resin condition. Most of the time, the resin is in worse condition than, than, than you really want to know. But we've got a couple things, like we've got this, this one here where we've got a two and a half millimeter depth of diffusion, and it's like brand new resin. So it could very well be that the chemical involved is almost meaningless, but we know that we can see two and a half millimeters of damage in it. Back to our FRP example, this is how we can take a look at it. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our full thickness, 
through the material to where we see the diffusion front, or and we also detect it, which that's five millimeters. That's the original corrosion barrier. So following, if we follow the rule that as soon as we have, have penetrated through the corrosion barrier into the structural layers at all, we need to take some action. Then, uh, then this is the boundary that we have to pay attention to. Then uh, now we know, in fact, in this case, it is still operating, but this becomes an owner and an operator requirement. Um, we know that you can probably run a little bit longer. In fact, this, uh, this vessel is in fact still in operation and it's coming in close to 30 years of life. Um, another way to show it too is with PDS here, where you can see we've got a 90%, 89% PDS all the way through to the diffusion front. We still have terrific and good structural compliance or structural performance here, but the corrosion barrier is damaged. Uh, we're going to see some that damage continue to grow, and we can monitor that in order to optimize the period of time or, or the lifetime for the customer. When we're reporting this, this is actually a really fun thing because we have two things that we have to pay attention to. One is the depth of damage, or down here, this detected depth. The other is the PDS of the detected depth, because if the PDS is very high and yet the detected depth is at the full depth of the corrosion barrier, perhaps there actually isn't anything to worry about. This becomes a bit more of a complicated assessment, but just to illustrate for the example that we've used, after 17 years, this is where we were, and we know that it's only going to go in this direction. It's only going to go somewhere in the area where this, where this blue shaded area is. When we're in the red zone, we definitely, we've already, we've lost the resin and we've exceeded the thickness of the original corrosion barrier. So that can certainly be a problem. This is set up with the right explanation to provide meaningful information for owners and operators to help them make critical decisions for the uh, reliability and, and operation of their facilities. The conclusions we offer to you are that we get good correlation of visible damage depth and ultra analytics results. The condition of the corrosion barrier can actually be quantified with non-destructive work. We can predict future corrosion barrier condition. The results actually relate back to the same tests that were used to help determine what materials you should have built it from. And this non-intrusive inspection will reduce confined space entry risk and significantly reduce total inspection costs. Thank you very much for listening to me through this. I invite you to contact UT Comp if you'd like any more information about this. Uh, inquire is at utcomp.com or, of course, go to our website. It's been my pleasure to speak to you on this. I'm Jeff Clarkson. Thank you.